Right. Um, let's get going. So my name is Oliver. I am the head of engineering at a company called Monzo. We're building a bank. Uh, we're based in London, so I don't know how many of you will have heard of us. We're reasonably popular in London, but we're not in the US yet. This is what we have right now. This is a prepaid debit card. We have about 70,000 of these in issue, but we are building a full retail bank. Behind the Monzo card, there is what we're trying to be is the best banking app in the world. And what this means is this is what you see when you open the app. So this is, this is somewhat different to what you might be used to from a banking app. Instead of these kind of cramped, indecipherable statement descriptors that you usually get, we actually show you the name of a merchant, Revolutionary, along with their logo and a real-time balance rather than something that's often delayed by 24 or 48 hours. Basically, we strive to make everything as clear and easy to understand as we can and kind of move mountains in the background to make this happen, but make things really clear and easy for the user. When you go into a transaction, you see a lot more kind of detail about that than what you might be used to. So this is my dinner from the other night. Um, so you see immediately there's, there's a map there of where I spent this money. There is the logo of the merchant. There's a real, you know, there's actually a, an understandable merchant name. There's a full street address. Because this transaction was, for me, abroad, this is in US dollars, it shows me the conversion rate, which is depressing right now because of Brexit. But um, there you go. It's categorized automatically as, an, as eating out. Um, and you can see I added two emoji to this transaction. And I could attach a receipt as well if I wanted to, to do my expenses. And with every transaction, you get an immediate instant push notification. So for this case, this is something I bought at a store in the UK called Tiger. You can see there's the Tiger emoji that went with it. People really love this stuff, uh, but it's really simple for us to do. One of my favorite features, though, is um, something, again, that's super simple. And once you've seen it, you wonder why this isn't part of every bank account in the world. But if you think you've lost your card, you can just freeze your card with a single tap. And then if I were to find it again, I can unfreeze it with another tap. Or if I don't find it, I can order a replacement within the app to be delivered to me the next day. So you can unfreeze it. But as I mentioned, in, as, well as, just, in, as well as building a prepaid card, we are building a full UK bank. Um, and with the ambitions to be an international bank at some point in the future. And instead of, though, waiting, waiting until we were a full bank to launch this thing, which is a very long process, we've been doing this since about February last year, so about 18 months now, actually a bit more than that. Um, and we're sort of getting toward the end of the part, where, you know, the, the application phase before we're a bank. Um, but we have a little way to go before we launch. But sometime next year, we'll be launching a full bank account, which means that in addition to all the things you can currently do with your Monzo card, you can get your salary paid into it, you can pay your rent from it, and you can borrow money from it. So we'll be doing overdraft lending. Although we don't kind of aspire to do everything that you might think of from a bank. So for instance, we don't necessarily want to offer mortgages to our customers. What we'd rather do is connect you with another company who is much better at providing mortgages than we'll ever be. To talk a bit more about our application, though, when we first started building Monzo, we sort of realized we wanted our applications to be these four things. And I'll sort of talk about what these mean to us and how Kubernetes helps us achieve these in this talk. The first one of these, I think, is really important. This is uh, extensible. So what this means is that we want to make our application really easy to change. And we want to make it easy to change not just now, but in 10 years or even 20 years from now. You know, what we have now will not be the gold standard of a bank account in 20 years, but we hope that we can continue to iterate our product much better than kind of legacy banks have been able to. And so a traditional architecture might look something like this. You have your application where all your business logic sits and it's connected to a database. This is like something like a Rails app. Over time, as you get bigger, you maybe add a cache as you start to get, you know, to make things, uh, to keep things fast, rather. And over time, you scale this out, you scale your application out, you start to balance among the replicas of your application. This is fairly standard stuff. And Again, you, over time, you start to replicate more and more things, including perhaps your database, which is a really painful thing to shard. But the big problem here is, over time, your application just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And developers contend working on one giant code base. Because this is deployed as one big unit, actually deploying it is quite risky. 
and you end up with things like the daily, weekly, or for many banks, an annual release cycle, which just kills basically any innovation in your product. And as many of you will know, you basically the, what you need to do here is to start breaking this thing up into, into different services. But basically, unless you're willing to spend really huge sums of uh, money and man hours on this thing, it's very difficult to get rid of the monolith in the center. It usually still remains in some form or other. For many banks, this is what they refer to as the core banking system, which is the thing at the center of everything. It controls how much money the bank owes to who and how much money is owed to the bank. Um, and usually, in a bank, it will run on something that looks a bit like this. This is a mainframe from the 80s. And literally, most banks still run on these things. And they back things up to tape every night. And this is just how things are. It's decades worth of cruft, basically, that, that holds you back. But you can't really get rid of it, because change is so risky in these environments. And to your customers, it still feels like this. It still feels very much like the 80s. It feels like not much has changed since then. And to be honest, on a technology level, not a great deal has changed since then. Um, so instead, right from the start, we started building our application as a collection of microservices. We have about 150 or so of them in production at the moment, and we're sort of adding more all the time. This might seem like um, overkill, especially in the early days of when you're building an application, but it's really worked for us. I think it perhaps did slow things down a little in the early days, but it's really started to help us now that we have a lot more engineers, and we're starting to add more engineers. I think that's... Um, that sort of covers that one. I don't really need to you know, preach microservices to you. I'm sure you've heard it lots of times before. Um, but one of, the, one of the things that, one of the problems with this architecture that we've seen and I've seen in previous roles is um, these are somewhat hard to make efficient. Um, and as a startup, we can't really afford huge IT budgets like a big bank. And we would like, as engineers, high utilization from our, from our hardware. So the sort of traditional model where you have one service per, per host doesn't really work, especially when you have as many services as we do. If we were to have, to have 150 separate different classes of hosts, that would be completely stupid. Um, so what we did in our early um, versions of our platform was we just simply ran all the services on all the hosts, which is fine when you have a relatively small number of services, you can do this. But as you start to get more and more services, you start to find that this, this breaks down. It's no, it doesn't work. You can't run 150 services on a single machine and expect them all to be fast, or 150 services on every machine and expect them all to be performant. So then you often end up breaking your, your infrastructure out into tiers, where you'll maybe have, like, like we did, you have, we had like an app tier, and we had a core tier, and we had a bunch of other things as well. But then the app tier is still kind of overutilized, there's too much contention there, and the core tier was underutilized, so there's, it's not desirable in any respect, really. What you really want is to treat your applications as a big pool of resources, which is ex exactly what Kubernetes allows you to do. So we can run just one big group of worker machines and run all of our applications there and scale them up and down as we want to do. And this has been really effective for us. This is um, a graph that shows how much we were spending on infrastructure. The red portion is our old infrastructure that did not run Kubernetes. The white portion is our new infrastructure that does run Kubernetes. And you can see that the new infrastructure costs about a third of the old one that the old one did, and it does exactly the same thing fundamentally as far as a user is concerned. So Kubernetes has been a really big win for us there. Um, this is going to be the section where I kind of go into some of the most detail, which is... Um, Resilient. What we want our application to be is to be available to our users all the time. No matter what's happening, we want them to be able to use their bank account, to be able to earn and spend their money. And this is very important to everyone. In, um, in a microservices world, though, you have, you have lots of different services that are often all talking to each other. A, a large portion of them are, are talking to other services. In fact, I think all of them are talking to at least one other service in our world. And failure can happen at any stage in this kind of pipeline. Um, and it's, it's, it can be quite hard to even reason about what's happening in this sort of architecture. And you need a really good RPC layer to help you manage this complexity. In kind of version one, we built one ourselves. We were using RabbitMQ for RPC, which didn't work out so great in the long run. Um, it, it was really good in the early days, but that wasn't 
where we wanted to continue going, especially as we moved into Kubernetes, it isn't really built for an environment where stuff moves around all the time, and especially just where RabbitMQ itself moves around all the time. And Kubernetes does provide a tool to help, help you with this. It's called services, but it's, it's kind of a blunt instrument. It just basically round robin balances your traffic to all of the, all of the uh, replicas behind that match a selector. So if you have a service with a name, and it will, it will balance all the traffic across those replicas of a service, but not necessarily very intelligently. Um, what you really want from a good RPC layer is actually it turns out to be a lot of things. It's, um, and we could, of course, build all this stuff ourselves, but that would, that would just be a, a real waste. And frankly, I don't think we can do it much better than um, has already been done. And fundamentally, what this boils down to is you're trying to do two things. You're trying to minimize the amount of time a request takes from the point of view of a user and um, maximize its chance of succeeding. And this kind of, as on the previous slide, boils down to many, many things. Um, what we use to do this is a piece of software called Linkerd. I know um, some of the guys from Linkerd are here at KubeCon as well. And um, we're really happy with it so far. They're at the front. Um, it's built on. Um, a piece of infrastructure that Twitter created called Finagle, which is their RPC framework. And it's been in use there for many years and at other companies. And we're really happy with, with what it does. And to give you an idea of how we actually run it, we run an instance of Linkerd on every single host in our platform, at least those that have these microservices running on them, which is the vast majority. Um, and this model is a pretty good fit for Linkerd and how we actually uh, do this is run it as a daemon set in Kubernetes. So it runs on all of the worker hosts. Um, and each service will talk to its local copy of Linkerd. So if I have this service here, my eyes service that wants to send a request to the unicorn service, it will send a request to its local Linkerd, and then it has to make a decision about where to send it then. There'll probably be many replicas. In our case, there's, there's at least three of every service that's running of every. Um, or in this case, the unicorn service. So what it will do is it will make a fairly complex decision about where to send this request. It will um, look at how the service has been performing over the last few minutes um, and send it to the one that's, that's been performing the best, basically. I mean, it's actually a lot more complicated than that, but I won't go into that here. And what it will then do is send the request to a remote instance of Linkerd, which will then forward it on to the... Um, to the host, to the service on the remote host, and then send the request back. One of the good things about this system where you have all these Linkerds talking to the other Linkerds rather than directly to each individual service is the connections within your system scales with regard to the number of hosts rather than the number of services, which usually is a much smaller number, especially in our case where each machine will be running 20 or 30 services. That, that results in a lot fewer connections between things. And so between any two hosts, there's only one connection necessary. And if failure happens at any point along this chain, things can be retried, or at least many things can be retried. Not every call in our infrastructure, at least at the moment, can be, unfortunately. But that kind of uses the HTTP verb to determine what that, uh, whether it's retriable or not. So HTTP has these idempotent methods, and it has uh, non-idempotent methods. So if it's an idempotent method, it's perfectly safe to try the request again, even if it's been sent in its entirety. And to take that upper level, we do something quite similar when a request comes into our infrastructure from the internet as well. We, use, we run all of our stuff on AWS, so it comes into an ELB. Then it gets forwarded to an edge um, service, which again is just running in Kubernetes. And then that just gets basically proxied into Linkerd and then sent to um, these service, this layer of services called API services, which are basically publicly facing um, APIs. And the, the edge will route it to one of those, depending on its path, basically. And again, this, this, is, this edge layer is basically just a simple proxy. It does a few other things. It does authentication. Um, and well, actually, authentication is one of the few things it does. And it does logging as well. Like it, it will assign a trace ID to each request, and then we can use that ID throughout our infrastructure to see what happened to that request. So this is, um, this is actually a really simple model, and it works really well for us. To sort of talk a bit more about something else we have to do as a bank, though. Um, we have to connect to lots and lots of systems. In our case, uh, at the moment, we're connecting to a few. One of them is MasterCard to do direct card payments. We'll be a direct member of MasterCard. And there's also a few other payment schemes in the UK. One of them is called Faster Payments. Another is Bax. And basically, every country in the world has payment schemes like this. And we'll be connecting to, to lots and lots of them over the, over the coming years. But 
most of these were built in a different era or with a different mindset in which communicating over the internet just isn't really acceptable. And most of these companies will want to bring a wire to you. But you can't really go to Amazon, where all our services are running, and say, can you just plug this wire into the cloud? That doesn't really work. That's not how, that's not how any of that stuff works. So what we actually do is we have to have physical infrastructure to do this. And fundamentally, all this is doing is connecting a wire from companies like MasterCard to a wire from AWS. They provide a service called um, Direct Connect. But actually, how we've done this, we think, is um, it's been interesting for me. I'm not a network engineer. I'm an application engineer. I'm sure this will be nothing new to network engineers, but I think it's interesting nonetheless. One of the problems with um, the infrastructure, if this is basically a, a diagram of how this would work. We connect the wires from MasterCard through to AWS in at least two data centers. One of the problems with this, though, is when the link between Amazon and one of these data centers goes down, there is still um, a link that's up between these third parties and one of those two data centers, and they will continue to send traffic there and think it's, it's available because from their perspective it is. There's something on the other end of the wire that's there talking to it. And uh, that's just really bad. You, you know, you'll still get, in that case, transactions from MasterCard being routed into a data center that then can't send them on to where they need to go. So terrible experience for users. The way we actually solve this is uh, using a technology called BGP. This is actually how the internet works, I learned. Quite interesting. Um, and what it basically says is each machine will say, I'm a router for this range of IP addresses. Send your traffic to me for, those, for that IP range. And you, there can be many different ways of reaching a given IP address, and it, it's basically determined by a series of waiting rules where, where traffic will actually get sent. But it continues to say, hey, I'm over here, hey, I'm over here, hey, I'm over here, until it doesn't. And then if something doesn't, um, so for instance, if this link was to go down, the BGP from Amazon would stop being broadcast to the data center, and it would be removed from the root table on the other end because it's no longer seeing advertisements from AWS, and then it would also stop being propagated to the third parties. So all of the link gets severed in that case, which is actually good in this case because we still have a redundant link up through another data center, which means that uh, we can still route traffic from end to end there. The way we actually do, th do this, excuse me, in Kubernetes has been interesting. Um, so in the data centers, we have a hardware VPN device that, that terminates the, the VPN. But on the Kubernetes end, things are, things are kind of more complex. You have, um, you have an overlay network with your, with your Kubernetes network, um, with your Kubernetes installation. And those IP addresses aren't necessarily routable from, from outside or from nodes that are not on that overlay network. So what we do there is we establish an IPsec tunnel from AWS to the data center, because that part is basically static routing, or actually there's BGP going the other way, but that will just complicate things even more. Um, and then through that tunnel, we broadcast BGP from a separate container, from using uh, open source tools, uh, something called GNU Zebra, all the way through the tunnel to the co-location facility, and then that gets broadcast onto third parties. This has been kind of interesting to do, because um, for instance, setting up an IPsec VPN requires special kernel privileges. It requires um, something called the net admin capability. And, but we want to be able to do this in containers. So we've, uh, we've had an interesting time getting that running and using some of the more um, unusual features of, of Kubernetes that you don't necessarily interact with every day, where you add and drop uh, privileges and kind of you have to have certain kernel modules available on the host to be able to do this. But it works actually really nicely in the end. It, it achieves what we want, which is when these links go down, so does everything, and traffic still remains routable through the, through the surviving connection. Last thing I want to talk about is secure. This one, again, as a bank, is, is very, very important, and we take it really seriously. We, we can't afford to lose people's money. We want people to trust us, and we don't want to lose money. Uh, security can mean so many different things, but um, one of the interesting ones I want to talk about is network isolation. When we first started with this infrastructure, and when I say this infrastructure, I mean our Kubernetes infrastructure, we, um, we adopted quite a, quite a traditional kind of you know, easy to understand design where you separate your infrastructure out into lots of different layers. So we would have the Kubernetes worker layer, we'd have the data layer where our databases live, we'd have a bunch of other layers. But over time you find it's desirable to run more and more of your applications in Kubernetes. I mean, eventually we want to run everything there, including our databases, we're not currently doing that. But, um, but sometime in the future, especially with, uh, with pet sets, we definitely want to do that. And then this layered model starts to break down because you just end up with, with one big layer rather than lots of individual layers. 
And what you really need is, is isolation within Kubernetes, not outside it and within the, within the overlay network. And how we do this is um, we use Calico. We use the network policy implementation part of Calico specifically. And so Kubernetes defines a network policy object. Cal Calico reads this and applies that configuration to the machine. Basically, all it's doing is configuring IP tables at the end of the day. But it's, a, it's an interesting thing. So what you can then do is have, basically what we do is we have zones within our infrastructure. We have um, like this super secure zone. A good example of what we might use this for is um, when a card payment comes in, we, we receive a message that contains the full card number. We don't really want the full card number propagating through all of our services. We don't want that available within our infrastructure, so we tokenize it into something that looks like a real card number but actually is a fake card number. And those services within that zone are, are, are PCI services, basically. So we're PCI level one compliant, and this is how we uh, achieve this. So things inside that zone cannot talk to things, or rather things outside that zone cannot talk to things inside that zone other than through very well-defined interfaces. And so basically you have controlled ingress into those zones. And this is really easy to, to make happen when you have this set up with Calico. You basically just set up this network policy object that says basically define this zone. This zone is defined as all, this, all the pods that have this particular label. And for those pods with that particular label, only pods that have these matching labels may talk to it. So in this case, this is a policy object that basically says only things inside the same zone as it can talk to those services. Um, as I said, this is implemented at a low level by IP tables, so fairly well understood technology. Um, and I think one of the interesting next steps will be to see if we can actually add some of this to Linkerd itself. We want to be able to extend this to more parts of our infrastructure. And when you have something that sits on every host kind of mediating the RPC communication, it's a fairly important place to have that. So that was kind of a whistle-stop tour of how we're, how we're approaching building infrastructure at Monzo. I'm happy to answer any questions. Before I do, I did want to do the uh, obligatory thing and point out that we're hiring. Especially, we'd love to have um, a Kubernetes contributor on the team so you can continue your work and also help us operate Kubernetes in, in a real environment. Um, so come and talk to me if, you, if you're interested in that at all. Um, yeah, I wonder if anyone has any questions. Yeah? Mm. So the question was, um, does this architecture pose obstacles when talking to regulators and, I guess, auditors? Yes, it does, is the short answer. Uh, this is very unfamiliar to an auditor. They will not have seen something like this before. But um, we basically can't build what we want to build if we were to build it in the same way that everything's been built before. So it makes a lot of sense to us to find auditors who are open-minded and who will work with us to do this and will you know, take the time to understand or to let us explain to them how our architecture works and how it meets these guidelines. Because fundamentally, any requirement we've ever seen from a regulator has never told us how to build something. It's just told us what they expect to have built. Um, but yeah, it is a challenge. And, uh, but it makes a lot of sense to us to spend time and money, basically, making them see, see it the same way we do. And of course, we want our stuff to be secure. And every, every requirement we've ever seen, you know, we go above and beyond that. But yeah, it's, it's different to what they've seen before. Yeah? Yes. So when you deploy in a node of service, how do you actually manage your accounts and whatnot to get somehow access by somebody else to the code? So um, the question is about data encryption at rest. Um, and yes, we do encrypt all the data at rest. All of, all of the disks that the data is stored on are encrypted. Um, I think what this boils down to is how do you get the secrets to the right places? Um, how do you ensure that basically the thing that should be able to decrypt this can only get the key to decrypt this? Um, we use a bunch of technologies for this. Vault is one of them by HashiCorp, and we use Amazon's KMS. I can't go into extraordinary detail about how a lot of this stuff works, but, but yeah, this boils down to kind of secret management, and that's something I'd love to do kind of a blog post at, about at some point in the future. But Vault is a really good technology. I would take a look at that. 
And I, th I think another big part of that is making sure that everything is auditable. So making sure there are events for everything that happened and you can figure out what has happened. And that, that helps with that as well. Yes, so, th so there, there is application layer security. Linkerd can also help with this. You can have all your communication between nodes secured automatically with Linkerd. Uh, that's not something we're doing at the moment. We might look at doing that in the future. But uh, th there are like application level things we do as well, yes. And to ensure that, that a request comes from kind of a trusted application or that, or that comes from someone who comes from an application that can assert um, who it is in a, in a trusted manner. Uh, so the question was, are there any requirements that mandate we have to have dedicated instances? Short answer, no. There are lots of requirements that say we have to isolate things sufficiently, but I've never ever seen one that says you must have a separate physical instance for these. If we were to come across one, we could certainly do it. We could use a dedicated instance on EC2 and add a special label to that that says only this application may run here. But um, we've not come across that, and I would be... I would be very skeptical of such a requirement if one did come up. Hey. Sorry, so the question was how do we audit the security of the containers? Mm -hmm. So, um, Underneath everything, we run CoreOS, which is a pretty stripped down Linux distribution that we update very regularly. Actually, the default configuration is for it to update itself, um, which is quite cool, but we don't actually have it updating itself. We do kind of control that. The images we build are, are very bare bones. They contain only the application. We don't use, you know, we don't, for instance, base it on a Ubuntu base image. We, we just have the application in there if we possibly can. And we have kind of our own CI pipeline that produces signed images at the end of it. Um, so basically a special set of, uh, of builder pods in this instance that have certain privileges and can sign uh, images so we know that they're ours. Good question. Um, are we using Namedy in addition to Linkerd? No, at the moment we're not. Our, um, D tabs, which are the, uh, the routing configuration for Linkerd, are entirely static. We would like to use Namerd in the future, though. One of the really good benefits of this is um, that we can do dynamic routing and change how the application behaves at runtime. Uh, so that's something we're going to do pretty soon, yeah. But at the minute, we don't. Yeah? Yeah, um, so the question was, are we doing any form of tracing? Uh, yes, lots and lots of tracing um, at many different levels. The majority of it at the minute is a system we've built ourselves called, or it's built on top of a system we built ourselves called Slog, which is structured logging. So whenever a request comes in, you can see all of the logs that relate to that request um, because it has a, 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 a trace ID that's assigned at the top level. So, and you get that on the response, and I can type that into. A, um, a web portal and see all of the log lines that were generated from that request. But that doesn't, um, that isn't the kind of tracing you're talking about, I think. The kind of tracing you're talking about is where you're able to view timing data for every RPC call made as part of a request. And uh, no, we're not doing anything about that in production at the moment, but we are, um, we're actually using a product called Helium. We've, uh, from the Linkerd guys that provides this, which is built on Zipkin. Hey. Yes. Mm -hmm. So the question was, have other banks shown interest in our technology stack? Uh, short answer, yes. We basically get uh, emails and stuff from people in the, uh, in the IT organizations of banks all the time that are in interested in our architecture, and they kind of... Basically, what we're building is what many of them would like um, to be able to have for themselves. But getting from where they are now to where, 
to where we are is just an enormous step, is an enormous um, project for these companies. And frankly, I don't think they will ever get there. Yeah. Hey. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, first part of that, what was wrong with RabbitMQ? Um, RabbitMQ, we found very hard to, to operate in a cloud environment. We didn't find it really built for that. And it's, not, it's more built as a message queue than a message bus, we found. But we have operated it at reasonable scale before. Um, but the, kind of, the clustering components of RabbitMQ are, are not very good, in my opinion. Um, it's not really designed to lose a node and to get that node replaced by another completely identical, but not quite the same node. Um, and also, the problem we had was we had to build basically an RPC library in every single language we wanted to use. We use Go for the vast majority of our services, but um, we're starting to use other languages as well. So for instance, uh, it makes sense to us to build certain services in Java, um, purely because there are libraries for lots of things in the financial world that are written in Java that don't exist in other, in other languages, and it's not really worth our time spending ages re-implementing these libraries. And um, the problem we had, though, is whenever we wanted to use a new language, we would then have to build a new RPC layer that talks the same language as every other service and talks over the same mechanisms. And then you have to end up building all these pieces of, um, pieces of functionality, like retrying and all of it into every single language and maintaining those libraries. And I've done that previously where, I mean, Frank, we only had two libraries. We only had a Go one and a Java one, and they were just so divergent after an amount of time because you had the majority of your services in Go and like a few services in Java. The Java one was terrible. And you end up building, uh, I think, what's been called a distributed monolith, where you have tons of shared code that have to go into all the services for them to even run. And that's just a very bad pattern, in my opinion. So it kind of... Um, we identified we wanted to use, if possible, HTTP to do, the, uh, to do the RPC between our services, which you might say is not the perfect RPC protocol, but it is very widely supported. Every language out there will have a pretty decent HTTP implementation in its standard library, and um, we wanted to use that. But we, as I said, we didn't want to have all of, this, um, all of this logic in every single application, and Linkerd kind of fits that bill very well. It, it abstracts that all into a service on its own, which um, means your service just has to speak H HTTP and know how to find its Linkerd, and that's all it has to be able to do. Hey. Sorry? Monitoring, how do we do monitoring? Oh, lots of different ways. Um, so we have, we have our own monitoring system. We have every service will expose some health checks and a monitoring system can go and get those health checks. Actually, Kubernetes can get them as well or it can get the overall status of the critical health checks of an instance. And um, then we can do alerting based off the back of that. We also have a, um, a metric system, which we, uh, we use InfluxDB for that at the moment. Um, and basically, every service can emit some, some metrics, and Linkerd does as well. Linkerd emits a lot of metrics about what's happening at the RPC layer. They get ingested into Influx, and then we can produce alerts based off the back of those, basically. And of course, there are lots more kind of, there are some more like business process level monitoring things in there as well that will monitor kind of what's happening and produce alerts to operational staff rather than to uh, engineers as well. Hi. What's our data model? Uh, what was the last part of your question, sorry? Well, is it based on your microservices? That's probably the question that I get asked. Sorry, Atomal? Atom, yeah, your, your, um, uh, your transactions with your, your database. Mm -hmm. Is it Atomal or is it Oh, I see, okay. So basically, all of our data currently is stored in Cassandra. Um, that's the database we use, which might sound a little bit crazy in a banking environment, but um, we do think it is actually a really good fit when you, when you take a look at it. Basically, every service will own its own database. Services do not talk to the databases of other services. If they want to get data or modify data, they have to talk to another service. And um, they do that through a series of endpoints on every service. And uh, I think you're asking about transactions as well. So the, the short answer to transactions is that there do not exist transactions that kind of span multiple 
RPCs, but there are mechanisms to compensate when something fails and to be able to roll back um, changes. But that, um, how we actually achieve things like transaction processing that has to happen exactly once um, is something we're working on at the moment, and I think that would, that would make an interesting talk all on its own when we've, uh, when we've actually got that working. Cool. Well, thank you very much. <laughs>